This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Luke Healy. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Luke Healy. His new book, How to Survive in the North, comes out this week from No Brow Press. But before I get to that conversation, I want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off the cover price, sometimes at 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. And one of the things that marks Discount Comic Book Service is its bundles, and you can't go wrong with the many bundles that they have, which is a great way of getting a lot of comics for a few bucks. And you have a variety of bundles at 50% off the cover price for this month, including the DC Hanna-Barbera bundle, the DC Kids bundle, the DC New Miniseries bundle, the DC Universe Rebirth bundles, number one, two, three, and four, as well as the DC Young Animal bundle from Gerard Way. You have great discounts every single month, bundled and otherwise, from Discount Comic Book Service. Their website is dcbservice.com. you got to go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your books there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. When I was at Small Press Expo back in September, I first met Luke Healy. I talked with him about his mini-comic, The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest Study Companion, which was nominated for an Ignance Award. And I was even able to talk with him for a few minutes for one of our on-location from the floor interviews that went up uh, soon after SPX. At the time when I was talking with him, he told me about a brand new book that would be soon coming out from No Brow Press, How to Survive in the North. And I began talking with him then about coming back on the Comics Alternative, this time for a one-on-one -on -one interview where we could talk more leisurely about his work. Well, Luke has now returned to his native Ireland, but he nonetheless was able to take time to talk with me about about the new Nobrow book, and we had a great time discussing how to survive in the North, the intersection of historical writing and fiction, his work in mini comics, and his growing work in more longer form narrative. It's a fun conversation, and let's give it a listen now. <laughs> I'm happy to have on the Comics Alternative podcast Luke Healy. His new book, How to Survive in the North, comes out this week from No Brow Press. Luke, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Well, Actually, I should say welcome again to the show because you and I spoke a couple of months ago at Small Press Expo. Yeah, I'm a returning favorite, I think. Yeah, although then I think you talked for no more than 10 minutes just because we were on the floor. There was a lot of action and ambient sound. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's an ideal environment for uh, for audio capturing. Exactly, but it does give you a sense of the action and the, the kinetics of, of a convention. But, but, but this is better in that we get to sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk about a much longer work than what you and I were discussing a couple of months ago, which was oh. The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest. Now, your book, How to Survive in the North, is about to come out, and maybe we can begin by having you introduce the premise to our listeners. 
Uh, sure. Uh, so How to Survive in the North uh, is a, a graphic novel, tells three stories. Um, two are nonfiction stories about Arctic survival, and one of them is a fictional sort of framing narrative that accompanies them about a professor at a college in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so uh, the the two nonfiction stories are, as to the best of my ability, captured from the truth. I did a lot of research on those, and then the uh, the fictional one is sort of like my literary conceit or whatever to uh, to bring it all together. Hopefully, yeah. Now let's talk or start with the historical angle of the book. Uh, how did you, I, I guess, discover? Uh, Stephenson and his expedition and the uh, the the actual real life historical elements that that uh, have gone into these two storylines. Um, well, it's kind of uh, just happenstance, I guess. I uh, was working on a comic when I was pl- applying to the Center for Cartoon Studies about a character who sort of went all over the world, and I was uh, on Google Images looking for an image of uh, Inuit clothing. Uh, sort of as a reference for characters that I was drawing. But uh, I was sort of struck by this one photo that appeared. And, you know, when you search Google Images, it's just all these tons and tons and tons of photos. And one really stood, stuck out to me of uh, a woman, an Inuit woman. It's just a very striking photo of her face. And so I clicked through onto the Wikipedia article and, uh, and just read through it. And it's about this woman called Ada Blackjack, who's one of the central characters in, uh, in How to Survive in the North. And she was uh, an Inuit seamstress who ended up marooned uh, on a, an Arctic island for two years. And I thought it was just this amazing story. Um, but I sort of, you know, filed it away in the back of my head thinking like, oh, that was interesting. That was an interesting sort of like 10 minutes to read about. Um, But then uh, a couple of years later at the Center for Cartoon Studies, when I was trying to decide what I wanted to work on for my thesis project, uh, which eventually became How to Survive in the North, that story sort of came back into my head and I I did a little bit more research about her. And I discovered that tons of primary sources of evidence for that expedition, including her uh, handwritten diary, were all in the library about 10 minutes away from where I was living and studying. Uh, and I just could not turn down the opportunity to to go and dig through it all and, and hopefully make something good out of it. So discovering the photograph, online photograph of Ada Blackjack was one of the instigating forces. Now, did that discovery eventually lead you to the Stephenson uh, expedition? Uh, yes. So the expedition that Ada Blackjack took part of in 1921, or began in 1921, went on until 1923, um, was organized by Wilhelm Stephenson. And as I was looking into uh, Ada Blackjack's story, I kept, I mean, Stephenson was a professor at Dartmouth College later in his life, which is where I was reading all of these uh, resources. He donated them to their library, their special collections library, and it was now publicly available. So when I was reading through all of those sources, I just kept reading tons of other stuff, kept coming up about this this other expedition that happened uh, years earlier in 1913. And when I began to look more into that, I thought it would be interesting and appropriate, hopefully, to incorporate more information about that expedition, provide sort of a wider context for uh for the kind of story that I was trying to tell about these uh, expeditions into the Arctic. Now you're talking about the different expeditions and the timelines of each. Now I want to discuss that a bit because if readers aren't careful, I think they may easily mix up these two different expeditions, one that takes place in 1913, and this is when we're introduced to Stephenson uh, as well as Captain Bartlett, uh, Bob Bartlett, who will go on to to take the ship that Stephenson um, uses in his uh, scientific expedition. And then the other one, which includes Ada Blackjack in 1921, and I say this because when I was first reading How to Survive in the North – I looked at the years, I paid attention to those time markers, but it didn't register that these were two distinct expeditions. And so for a while, I was getting the two kind of mixed up in my head. And in your three storylines, and I want to talk about the the fictional one at at Dartmouth in in a moment, but with the two historically based ones, you go back and forth, back and forth in in a very smooth manner uh, to the point that it's almost as if one of the storylines easily wraps around or melds with another. 
But that's definitely not the case because you include I I I feel you know various clues. I think your use of color uh, makes mm-hmm. it uh, once you determine once you realize what you're doing, it it lets the reader realize that you're on one storyline or the other. But again, it's it, it's subtle. And so did did you? I guess my question from all of this setup is, <laughs> did you intend to be subtle? in your representation of these two distinct expeditions and the storylines, uh, did you want the reader to kind of mix them up in some way? Um, I did. Well, mix them up. Maybe that's going a step further than sort of what I wanted, but I, I always wanted the sort of the distinctions between them to be a little vague. Um, I will say that uh, a commonly leveled criticism about this book is that it's confusing. Um, but I actually like that. Um, it's kind of what I wanted to go for. I always wanted this to be something that you had to put together a little bit. Um, I appreciate as a reader work that sort of challenges me to, to put in some effort in terms of like unspooling it. Um, and I always wanted from the start this book to be like a, a broader exploration of certain themes rather than a specific sort of like tense narrative uh, experience. Um, I think that's that's something that I'm interested in in all of my work, frankly. Um, I think that writing a straightforward story that builds tension and then resolves the tension at the end is easy. Um, and I don't love to consume media like that. I, I prefer something that really explores a topic um, from many angles. And so I really, really, more than anything, just wanted to like use the Nonfiction. The, the use the frame of these nonfiction stories to discuss some. Oh man, I'm like really, really uh, babbling here. But basically, it's kind of. It doesn't really matter if you like understand that they're two separate expeditions because like the the sort of record of events is not really what the book's about, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like you in that I'm much prefer texts that require work from me that I have to put together the narrative. In other words, I'm not spoon fed what's going on. And not that there's anything wrong with a straightforward story where you can almost passively sit back and consume. Um, but I prefer putting work into my understanding. So uh, that's one of the reasons why this book really resonated with me. Now, you mentioned a second ago one of the criticisms of the book. Um, now, now, this is going to be released, at least in the U.S., this week. Um, so uh, what kind of criticism are you referring to? Um, so the the sort of publication schedule for this book is like a little confusing even to me. Uh, it was released in the United Kingdom, Europe, and sort of uh, Australia, other English-speaking territories, territories except for the United States back in May. Um, so it's been available to a lot of people, critics included, for several months um, at this stage. So there, there have been a, a number of reviews about this book. And then also uh, leading up to the American publication date, uh, critics such as yourself have been, you know, like provided copies of the book. And, and a lot of criticism has come out about it um, before now as sort of like previews. That's how they've been sort of uh, uh, categorized on a lot of the, the websites that have been posting reviews. Mm-hmm. Um which is great. I feel very lucky that um, people are reading it and talking about it. And the criticism overwhelmingly has been really kind, which I appreciate. Um, but I will say it is such a, a bizarre, fascinating experience to like actually have people engaging with your work and then saying something about it. It's, it's not something I, I've really experienced it into my career thus far. So it's, it's a whole new game. So you didn't get a, near as much of that with your various mini comics. Uh, not really. I mean, I, I, the, I haven't really received too much feedback on my mini comics. I'd won some awards, which was cool. Um, that was really exciting and I obviously appreciated them, but the, the sort of like magnitude of the feedback that I received was, you know, like a post on a blog that says this comic won this award and, you know, people didn't really post it. I, I would say that the amount of people who have actually read my comics is probably pretty low until How to Survive in the North came out. Hmm. Now, you know, we were 
talking a moment about the various storylines here. And, and that third one, the fictional one, includes a professor at Dartmouth named Sully and his dilemma, which is in many ways vastly different from that of, let's say, Captain Bartlett, Ada Blackjack, and, and, and the others on those expeditions. Um, why the decision to include this fictional storyline in a largely historical narrative? Um. I think the reason that I included it really mutated over the course of the production of the book. Uh, at first, when I was doing all of this research into these two true stories, um, well, the the first sort of idea for the book was that I really just wanted to to do a book about Ada Blackjack, the the central, the sort of in the middle timeline wise expedition that's included in the book. And then the more I read about the 1913 expedition, I I thought I I have to include that too. Um, and then as I kept reading and researching, it was so difficult to not include information that takes place about what happened to these people after the conclusion of the expeditions that are um, depicted in the book, uh, especially uh, Wilhelm Stephenson, because I think what happened with his life and his career afterwards is also interesting. And so at first, I wrote in the contemporary fictional narrative with the character uh, Barnaby sort of just being a stand-in for me, a person who was just simply like researching the expeditions and he was going to be sort of like an exposition, expositional character who was like expanding these additional facts because I, I never wanted to break away from the perspective of the, the characters, the two central characters in the other expeditions. I always wanted what we were seeing to be like directly from their perspective um, I didn't want to use narration. I didn't want to show us what other characters were doing when they weren't present. And so I decided that I would include this third character who would sort of be a conduit for this extra information. However, over the course of working on the book, I think that really fell away in in a lot of ways. I think uh, the the sort of nature of it, of the the setting for the story, it being in Dartmouth College, um, still provides some information about the fate of particularly Wilhelm R. Stevenson after these expeditions, but I think it ended up becoming more strongly a thematic match for the other two stories. Thematic in the sense of, let's say, truth, history, and fiction? So I am pretty fascinated with the relationship between fiction and nonfiction, um, particularly in comics. I studied journalism uh, in my undergrad degree, and, and we had to take a course on nonfiction novel writing. Um, and I think that in any medium, people have to sort of draw the line between what they consider fiction and what they consider nonfiction. But I think in comics, that's especially true. Um, you know, if you discount a memoir, which is like inherently filtered through some through the author's perspective, it's like inherent and explicit in the form. I think that doing true nonfiction in comics is like very difficult, at least by the by my standards. I, again, I think everybody has to draw their own line as to what counts as nonfiction. But when you add illustrations to a story, uh, especially because in comics, so much comics nonfiction uh, introduces like invented dialogue because it's hard to have a record of the exact dialogue or the exact words that people spoke. I mean, particularly in, in a case like the book that, that I ended up making, I think that it, it, the author has so much of a fingerprint on it that I almost think that it can't be called nonfiction. Um, and so for me, the addition of this fictional narrative like truly pushes the the full book as a work into the realm of fiction. I, I consider it a work of fiction and I ask that it be, I ask my publishers to designate it as a work of fiction, uh, even though it's heavily based on true elements, a lot of the book. Um, and so the inclusion of Sully's story for me was a, uh, part of a broader examination of the central theme of the book, which is about uh, the power dynamics in relationships, because I wanted this fictional story to be running alongside the, the you know, the quote unquote nonfiction stories throughout the book to be constantly reminding the reader that ultimately I, Luke Healy, the author of this book, have the power to say and do whatever I want with these characters who are based on real people. Um, and throughout the entirety of the book, the 
fictional and non-fictional threads are presented as equal. In fact, I don't even note in the book until the afterward that the contemporary story is a work of fiction. Um, I, I don't I don't designate that in the text. And so I just want when people read it, I, I don't want anybody to to look at this work and think, man, this is like the gospel truth of everything that happened, because that's impossible for me to recreate in in comics if that makes any sense. <laughs> oh, it does. And uh, I appreciate the way that, you know, you're melding fiction and nonfiction in such a way that you're questioning, you know, how can we represent accurately to the point where we can truly call something nonfiction, where any representation, when it comes right down to it, is kind of a fictionalization of some sort. Sure. I mean, it's... It's like the great regress of journalism, you know, like you can really, really pull the the focus back further and further and further and like really question the truth of any record um, because they're inherently imbued, imbued with our perspective. But I think that comics has a harder time than prose in that regard. I mean, like you can look at a, a, a one paragraph article in a, news, in a newspaper that appears to be just like a list of facts. And yes, those facts can all be literally true, but the the journalist who wrote that piece and the editors who edited that piece ultimately are also deciding what is the truth because they're deciding what to include, what not to include in the order to present the information. And, you know, they're including the context within which it's reported, like whether it runs against ads for certain products, what other articles are placed on the same pages of. And so you can keep going back further and further and further until you get into the like, you know, somewhat dangerous headspace of like, well, nothing is true, man. Like, what is truth? Um, which I don't think is like a particularly interesting or um, exciting, you know, like avenue to examine. But I do think that comics just has a harder time of it. I mean, I have a, a friend who's an excellent cartoonist and an excellent comics journalist um, called Larry Harris. She's really, really great. And I recommend people read her comics. But she, in her comics, only includes direct quotes uh, in, in she she did a historical comic um in the last couple of years and you know she only included like direct quotes from uh primary sources from people who are at the event which i find admirable and i think that's probably you know like the most sort of valid argument for a piece of comics nonfiction that you can have but it still includes illustrations you know and so right it's just, you know, you've got to, like I said, you've got to draw your own lines about what counts, what counts as nonfiction and what doesn't. But if I had done a comic that was a, a historical comic, uh, like the, the you know, quote unquote, nonfiction sections in How to Survive in the North, without, inc without commenting on that, it would have felt very disingenuous to me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, because it's not a, it's not historical record. This is, this is my perspective on true events, you know? from a hundred years of remove. Yeah. You, you were talking earlier about trying to find a theme or, or readers attempting to see some kind of theme in how to survive in the North. And, and I was curious to hear you say that the way that you were seeing it, it, it has something to do with power relationships, which I can definitely see in, in the book. And along with that though, I found maybe a potential theme or a key to some theme in the text appear toward the end. And I don't think this is any kind of spoiler or giving anything away. And this occurs in the fictional storyline, quote unquote fictional storyline, with, uh, with uh, Sully in the end when he is confronting his young lover, Kevin, and Kevin comes over to see him and S Sully is really worked up. And Kevin is not sure why. And Sully is saying, and I'm looking at, uh, what, pages 174 and 175 here, where Sully says, they weren't ready. They should have known better. They didn't think about the consequences. The expeditions were always a terrible idea, but they let themselves get talked into something stupid, and it fucked up their whole lives. And, of course, Kevin has no clue what Sully is talking mm -hmm. about here, which I think makes this scene even more poignant. But for me, when I read this, 
that seemed to be the connective tissue, or at least the thematic connective tissue, between the two historically based storylines, those different expeditions, and what's going on with Sully, because you could argue that what he just said to Kevin is basically his situation. He wasn't ready. He didn't think through the consequences. And now he is in a particular place that is not that dissimilar, maybe in a broader sense, to what we see with Ada Blackjack and Captain Bartlett. Yeah, sure. Um, and when I wrote that scene and, and when I was working on the book, you know, when, when I was working through the story of the book from the beginning to the end, particularly with the 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 resources about the two true expeditions that really happened, you know, I was really searching for uh, connective tissue. I sort of wanted to throw throw all this stuff in a blender and, and really see what came at the other end. And when I came to that sort of end of the book, I thought that that was really the what was bringing it all together. And I do think that the the stories have that in common, and that's like an embedded theme in the book for sure. Um I think like with a little bit of remove in retrospect, I don't think the book is like quite as much about that as I had originally intended or believed at the time. Um, And so it is interesting for me now. I mean, I think like, first of all, like, you know, whether a a theme is intentionally inserted into the book or not, you know, doesn't mean that it it does or doesn't exist within the work. Um, I think, you know, like all interpretations are, are, are totally valid. And that certainly is like the the theme that the book is like screaming at you like, hey, this is what this is about. Like basically that last scene is saying to you like, hey, this is what this whole book has been about. Um, with some distance and perspective, like rereading the book, for me, that's not really what it's about. But, you know, I'm like a neurotic, crazy person who's spent two years reading about all of these people and then, you know, a ton of time, you know, like processing that, reformatting it and placing it all out. And I think that every time I come back to this book with a little space, I'm going to I'm going to see it as being about something else. But it's it's all in there, you know. Yeah. Well, so maybe your situation is not that different from Sully's in that uh, you <laughs> became enmeshed in this historical narrative to the point of almost becoming obsessed. I mean, totally like he is based on me, like the, the sort of scandalous, uh, uh, affair that he has and his position as a, a teacher in like an Ivy league university that, that has nothing to do with me. But, you know, I, I wrote this book, um, after a, a very sort of like isolating winter in the middle of Vermont reading about Arctic expeditions, you know? <laughs> um, and so, so he, I mean, he, he initially directly started as like a stand in for me. Um, and I think that the, his story evolved beyond that. And I tried to like remove more and more of myself from that character as I, I went through the writing of the book, but like, you know, he's me. I can't, I can't like remove myself too much from that really. Right. So he's like a stand in for you, but also he's a proxy for the reader because, you know, we getting back to the function of this fictional storyline with Sully at Dartmouth, uh, you know, as he goes through and learns about the stories of Bartlett, Stephenson, Ada Blackjack and others, uh, we as readers learn it as well. And so it, it seems at the end almost as if what we've been reading along are the kind of things that Sully has been reading. So in that sense, he becomes kind of a proxy to the reader. Yeah, for sure. I mean, also just out of the sort of baseline uh, human way that we process stories, like we're going to probably look for the the character who is is most similar to us. And I think by default, him existing in 2013 you know, for most people puts puts them closer to that. You know, he lives in the world that we live in, whereas the other characters are on these sort of like totally out of the box, mad expeditions that, you know, most of us have never been to the Arctic Circle. We don't really know what it's like to be stuck in a tent for two years, you know. Um, and so I think that, you know, he, he grounds the story in a lot of ways. And it, it makes sense for me um, that he would be the the person that most readers sort of like identify with. Mm. We were talking earlier about some of the connective tissue. Uh, there are other bits of uh, narrative elements that connect the various stories one to the other, especially in terms of the two expeditions. And, and, and one of those characters 
is uh, Fred Maurer. Is that how? You, is that who Maurer? I I have actually yeah I've actually never heard it spoken aloud. I've only read it, but I think it's pronounced Maurer. 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 Okay. I th- I'm actually not sure though. Okay, because we learn, or at least I learned. It wasn't until I guess the second half of the book that I began to to realize that this is one of the characters. That was in both expeditions, what, the one in uh, 1913 and then the one in 1921 as well. Because at some point, Moore says to, I don't know if it's to Ada Blackjack or one of the others on that later expedition, that he knows of another attempt to look into this region, and the others don't understand what he's referring to there. And then I fl- when after I read that, I flipped back, and I thought, oh, okay, so this is the same character that we see in the 1913 story. Yeah, he's the only character who appears in both, like on, on the page. The other characters have relationships to both expeditions, but he's the only character that appears. We, we see him both in 1913 and in 1921. Right. And, and there's another character toward the end that we see briefly, just for a few pages. And this is a, a young boy who goes by the name of Baron Jack. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, he only appears in the 1913 expedition. Right. And I'm wondering, though, if his – the what he's called Baron Jack, if that Jack is connected to Ada Black Jack. Oh, um, he not not intentionally, but that is interesting. No, they're they're both based on on separate real people. Because I wondered about that. I didn't know how common a name or a designation of some sort of nickname would be uh, like that. And then I started to think, okay, so maybe Baron Jack in some way is linked to Ada's. Uh, the, the the father of her child who's no longer around, and I, I don't know. I, I I didn't think too long about that is it. Interesting. That but I he does sort of give off that energy. At least when I when I read about him, he sort of sort of seemed like a puckish, like you know, I don't know, like a guy who maybe wouldn't be around with his his family. Exactly. I mean, his nickname is Baron Jack. It's like yeah, and he takes he takes Bartlett's gun and doesn't want to give it back. Um, sort of. Well, he's given. Uh, he's given the gun. I guess he's given the gun. Yeah, they sort of, you know, like trade the gun for dogs, mm-hmm. um, which they need to to escape the uh, the wastes of Siberia, of northern Siberia. It's interesting. I think that you know, the more I, the more time I, I spend thinking about these expeditions, which I, I still do, even though I've not been working on this book for almost a full year now. Um, the parallels, I think, are very interesting. Um, you know, in the 1913 expedition, uh, Stephenson, uh, this is mentioned in the book. We don't get to see it, but Stephenson sort of like abandons the ship. He says he's going to go off hunting and, and then he doesn't come back. And that's quite early in the story. Um, but we sort of learn later that he then went on to survive based on the kindness of uh, of remote villages of uh, um, Alaskan natives uh, and then he went and wrote a book called The Friendly Arctic. And then later in the book, we, we see Bartlett basically attempt the same thing, uh, but in Siberia, where he's sort of going going between villages uh, of people who are helping him out. Yeah, you mentioned this in the, I don't know, the note or the foreword at the very beginning of the book. I guess your introduction is what it's called, where Stephenson in the, what, the, the Friendly Arctic believed that the resources that humans needed to survive in that region is actually there. It's underneath the ice if we only, you know, tapped into that resource, which, you know, sounds a little off uh, when you think about it. Um, but, but you know, that, that element, I guess, really doesn't come out in the story proper, does it? Although – Yeah. Uh, it's sort of the – Takes a no, scientist ahead. up there. Yeah, he packs the. I mean, the the first expedition, um, the nineteen thirteen one, is is technically a scientific expedition. That's sort of how it was framed because it was like an exploratory scientific expedition to like learn more about the Arctic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but yeah, 
I think that the the reason I, I I decided to include that forward quite late in the process of making the book um, because I, I had read much of Stephenson's book The Friendly Arctic before I had you know like hammered out all the stories and these books are you know they're not really about that but I think it's like a a, a common linking piece of of information that just I mean I, I think it serves as a metaphor this idea that he believes that the Arctic is actually, oh, it's not that bad. And then he he sort of puts together these two expeditions like to covertly prove that theory. And then he's proven wrong and he writes a book about how it's true anyway. Um, <laughs> that to me is like very interesting. Um, but yeah, he, he had some pretty kooky theories. He basically thought you could drill a big hole in the ice and catch an unlimited number of seals to power all your lamps with their oil and, and serve as food forever. But oh man, it's just like, he basically is like, oh, the, the people who who have, have been living and evolving in this environment for like thousands of years, they don't go further north past a certain thing, but it's just because they don't get it. They don't know how to survive any further north. And it's so arrogant, man, that dude. Mm. Now, this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, your first long form comic, correct? Uh, yeah, before this, the longest comic that I had made was about 50 pages, something like that. Okay, so what are some of the differences, now that, you, now that you've published How to Survive in the North uh, earlier this year in, uh, you know, in overseas, um, do you prefer shorter form comics, longer form, are you going to do more of the, got what many people call graphic novel type uh, works? Um, I think I will. I've started working on another one now. Uh, I think the processes of, of making them are very, very different. Um, it was like a totally new experience trying to do something so long because, you know, if I, I, I'd done a, a comic, you know, like I said, that was, you know, 45 pages, something like that. So, so how to survive in the North is about four times that long, but it's not the same as doing four 45 page comics. You know, it's just like a whole, it's like a sprint versus a marathon. You know what I mean? Running a sprint, running a marathon is not like running a sprint over and over and over again. It's just like you have to work a completely different way. Um, but I think that there are advantages that I like about doing long works. Um, my sort of like natural instinct in terms of how I, I, I tell stories and pace my pages always tends to be out to, to do longer stuff. Like that's, definitely like what I'm more interested in doing um, in terms of making effective work that can be read by more people and that can generate an income for me. Uh, short comics are, you know, frankly, the only way to go about it. There's not much profit in making a graphic novel for almost three years um, just because the, it's such a monumental amount of work um, compared to, to the money you're ever going to receive, even if you're very successful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so short form, I mean, I'm interested in it for the, the like formal merits of it, certainly. Uh, and I enjoy doing it and it's very satisfying to be able to like, you know, polish that little rock into something perfect. Um, but, but for me, I think moving forward, I, I'm going to focus on doing another, another long book. Mm. Now you mentioned that previous to how to survive in the North, the longest comic that you had written was about fi around 50 pages or so. Uh, length uh, is this the unofficial cuckoo's nest study companion? No, uh, I made uh, the uh, unofficial cuckoo's nest after I finished How to Survive in the North. Right, right after actually, I, I finished it and then I immediately worked on Cuckoo's Nest for the next couple of months. Um, the the longest comic I'd made before was called I love long titles. In case you couldn't guess, it was called Of the Monstrous Pictures of Whales, which is a, a chapter title from Moby Dick, and it's about a a family that go on a whale watching cruise together. Um, and that was actually my first comic that was sort of like, uh, received by any sort of wider audience than just my friends. Uh, I won a, a mocha fest award for that one. Um, so that was, that was really cool. Um, and it encouraged me, that was the longest thing I had made to date. And it encouraged me to like, keep pushing longer form stuff, you know? Mm hmm. Um, Cuckoo's Nest, Cuckoo's Nest is about 60 pages and that was, <laughs> you know, when I finished How to Survive, I was like, man, I, I want to make something short to like get out, get out all the ideas that I had not been able to work on for the last couple of years. Um, but 60 pages really isn't that short in terms of comics. It still takes a long time to draw 60 pages of comics, turns out. 
Mm. Well, let's talk a bit about the unofficial cuckoo's nest study companion because it, well, we talked about it a little bit at SPX, but but again, we're there, uh, you know, on the floor in the chaos of uh, the convention. So, where did the idea come for this quite unusual comic? Because it's it's definitely unconventional, and you mix media. Yeah. Um, so I think the the, the Cookies Nest comic for me is like my statement. It's like my my artist statement, or like my thesis on on comics at the moment. Um, I so it, like I said, it comes from lots of ideas that I was ha- having while I was working on how to survive in the North. Um, and I, I think like if we think of comics as the, the combination of words and pictures, I think the possibilities of that relationship are being massively underutilized. Um, I think that the cuckoo's nest for me is like all about efficiency. Uh, it's about what's the most efficient way to, describe this experience or information to somebody. And so when I was working through that comic, uh, that was always what I kept at the front of my mind. If it was more efficient and effective to use prose, I would use prose. So a lot of um, information is given through to the reader through prose. Um, atmosphere is mainly conveyed by the pictures or action um, because I think it is more efficient to use a picture to describe somebody's face than it is to write out what their facial expression looks like. Um, and dialogue, I think, is often it's funny to me the way people treat dialogue in comics, because you can combine it with acting. You can you can draw your characters so that they're acting in a certain way and communicate a lot. But also a lot of the time you don't need to have that kind of communication. You know, one picture will do. So a lot of the cuckoo's nest is, you know, like a, a single picture with like a script underneath it, which is not a. a you know, that's not an innovation on my part. Like other creators do that. Posey Simmons, uh, English cartoonist, has done that a lot. And Andrew Hussey, who uh, created uh, the comic Homestuck, also did that. But I, I, I just think, like, if we're going to use words and pictures, like, let's use words and pictures. Like, let's try to push these media together in a way that makes sense to try and try and communicate better. And that's why the, the Cookies Nest, the story of it is about... Um, communication and more specifically miscommunication um and then also i wanted to sort of pay lip service in the the plot of that comic to the fact that i was using prose elements and script elements and comics elements by having the story be about somebody who's trying to adapt a book into a stage play mm-hmm. um and so that that i think like that's the core story of the, of the book um and i'm i'm very happy with that i think it reads well and i think the characters are like empathetic but that is sort of like the dressing over which I lie my overlay my like creative thesis on the flaws of comics, I guess, which is very uh, egotistical, but I did it <laughs> and I'm happy with it. So there we go. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, other creators, comics creators have used that kind of dramatic dialogue, you know, the script like one would find in a uh, theater, theater um, script. Uh, but you're doing something very different because you mix that with, I guess, comics proper, with pro sections, with other kinds of rhetoric such as lists and forms. Uh, but you also mix media. We have the illustrations that are mixed in, sometimes almost indistinguishably, with uh, photograph reproductions. And then there's the reading experience because it, it took me a while when I first picked this up earlier this year to get the rhythm of what you were doing because I was reading, I guess – you could call it traditional comics, you know, left to right, go down to the next tier, left to right. But that's sure, not yeah. the way you read in the unofficial cuckoo's nest. Uh, it's almost as if you have four pages on a page, and that's how you go through and you have to read. So within each of the pages, within a page, you read traditionally. Mm-hmm. But that yeah, could be a um, trip up. <laughs> this is uh, this is like the 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 one element of that comic that I think like more more so than any any of the other like experiments that I I was trying to like conduct or whatever with that work, um, sort of does push the bounds of you know making a reader uh, have to work a little bit um, because you do have to figure that out. Like when you pick up the book, there's no indication that you have to read it that way. Um, but the way I think about those sort of like clusters of panels is uh as paragraphs you know when we if, if you look at a book like i think 
to me, Tintin is like the prototypical example of like clear visual storytelling. And it works like sentences, right? You start at the top left and you work across and each tier is almost like a paragraph. And they're divided by the gutters between the, the tiers are wider so that we know not to jump down from the top, from the top. You know, we, we know to read across because those panels are clustered closer together. And so in the cuckoo's nest, I wanted to sort of look at a different ways that you could use that in your page composition. So if you, you know, if you were to flip open to a random page in the cuckoo's nest, you notice that the, the comics all still fit within a grid, but the, you know, quote unquote paragraphs that you're supposed to read together, they don't have any gaps between the panels. They're all sort of interconnected. And so they sort of like exist in these clusters. Um, and so you, you read one cluster and then you go over to the next cluster. And, and I wanted them to like, sort of exist as as more individual moments in a way that I think that uh, tears usually work in comics. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, The Unofficial Cuckoo's Nest was nominated this year for an Ignatz Award in the Outstanding Mini Comic category. Um, what was your experience upon learning that you were nominated for an Ignatz? Um, it was interesting. Uh, at the time, I found out uh, so I, I spent the last six months uh, or the, the sort of five months preceding SPX uh, hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, which is a, a wilderness trail that goes up the west coast of the United States. Um, and so I was actually out in the woods when the Ignatz nominations were announced. And I, I didn't really have Internet access for like five or six days on end. So I got into town and saw it, I think, a day or two after it. I, you know, it had come out and people had sent me some, some kind messages about it. So that was a, a funny way to like learn about it. Um, yeah, I, sorry, I forgot your question. I went pretty off track. No, there. you, no, you answered the question. Like, what was your experience, uh, when you found that out and, you know, you found out, you know, a few days after the fact. Yeah, I did. Um, and I, you know, I was obviously very happy to be nominated. Um, I certainly made it more of a priority to get to SPX this year. <laughs> Yeah, because um, I wanted to be there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about this year's nominees, especially under the outstanding mini comic category, is that every one of you guys, you know, outstanding. And I could see getting the award. I mean, I'm sorry you didn't uh, get it. Hey, no, but, I'm not, but you I'm were not in hurting. great company. Oh, I was so excited to be included among uh, such a, an excellent list of cartoonists. And it was nice. You know, I got to meet um, most of the other people who were nominated. I was right next. I mean, you saw me. I was right next to Pranus Nayukaitis. Um, so we literally stood shoulder to shoulder for two days. And, and then directly across was Carl and Nowak, who eventually uh, was voted the winner of the award. And so I think, you know, awards like that, I'm always excited about stuff like the Ignatz because, you know, when I attended SPX a few years ago, the first thing I did was go around and, you know, purchase all the Ignatz nominated comics because I, I love many comics and I like to read good many comics. And so it was really very exciting to just be included, frankly. Mm. So you didn't know Pranus before this year's SPX? Uh, we had met very briefly a couple of years ago, but not really. Yeah. I, I asked because you guys seemed really buddy buddy when I met the two of you. Oh, it's just comics breaking down barriers, Derek. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's it. It's about bringing people together, obviously. That's why I make such alienating, weird work. <laughs> you know, so you were talking about some of your shorter comics, like of the monstrous pictures of whales, and some, though, shorter pieces have been collected in various anthologies. I think Exquisite Corpse was included in Maple Key, and then yeah. Mountain Take Me, that was issue, what, five of Irene? Uh, I believe five, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, what is your experience working with various anthologies? Do you plan on doing more of that? Hey, if people want to have me, I'm always interested in, in working with other cartoonists. I actually... Um, with two of my fellow classmates at the Center for Cartoon Studies started a small press and we put out four issues of an anthology of our own called uh, Dog City, which was sort of like a formal experimentalist anthology. Um, and I'm really proud of how those came out. But to me, always the most sort of positive results of that experience have been uh, just like an increase in communication, camaraderie, and, and uh, exchange of ideas between other cartoonists. Uh, I love that. And, you know, uh, especially with the, the fourth issue of our anthology, Dog City, 
we made a, a great effort to keep everybody talking to each other and in contact. I think uh, sometimes when you sign up for an anthology, you're sort of given a deadline and then, you know, you 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 turn in something a little while later, which is fine. Um, it's nice to just have your work published and, and read. But we really try to exemplify that side of, of participating in a comics anthology. You know, it's about making new friends in comics who have good ideas that you can all hopefully exchange and, and learn from each other. Yeah, you know, I've talked with both Dakota McFadzine and Andy Warner a couple of times, and, you know, they're two of the creative forces behind Irene, and that's one of the things that they've emphasized every time we talk about the anthology, and that is the friendship, you know, bringing people together. Because I've asked them before on a couple of occasions, how do you choose the pieces and the contributors that go into each issue of Irene? And first and foremost, it's friends, people that we went to school with, people whom we know and whose work we respect. Uh, yeah, it's comics is a, a career that, you know, mostly you have to do alone. So any opportunities to, to not have to do it alone, I think, are, are pretty welcomed by most cartoonists. That's certainly always welcomed by me. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Dog City. It, will we see no other issues of Dog City now? Um, I think the fate is, uh, is sort of up in the air of Dog City. Um we put out an issue this year. Gosh, maybe it was last year. No, it was early this year. We put out an issue this year that I'm very proud of. Actually, it was entirely collaborative comics was sort of the, the theme or idea of this year. I think it'll probably continue in some form, but we're not quite sure what that's going to be just yet. Okay, because the way you spoke earlier, I got the sense that maybe we may not see any other issues. I mean, never say never. You know, we don't have anything specific in the works, um, but the you know, I'm still in, in regular contact. I'm great friends with both of the other editors, and, and every so often we'll float an idea. Um, I think 2016 for us was, you know, mostly a year to, to refocus on our own stuff. Um, and, you know, for me, it was also a time to spend most of the year in the woods uh, out of contact. Um, so there hasn't been too much forward momentum on any Dog City projects, but, you know, like I said, never say never. I love working on them, and I love working with those guys, so so hopefully something else in the future. Yeah, you know, I'm fascinated by the phenomena of the comics anthology, and, and not just or not necessarily by those, let's say, by larger trade publishers. I mean, you know, you have the, the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, you know, Best American Comics Anthology that comes out every year. You know, Yale University Press has done theirs. McSweeney's has done one. I, I'm talking about, you know, lower key anthologies, uh, something like Dog City or Irene, where, you know, friends, creators get together and say, hey, kids, let's put on a play, or, so to speak, right? Yeah, and then they for pull sure. together an anthology, and it flies under most readers' radar. And to me, those are the most exciting kind of finds. And so over the past several years, discovering Dog City and Irene and, and, and others as well, um, I, I, I enjoy that. Uh, and I think I we need more I appreciate you those. saying that. Totally. I mean, I, I agree. I think like the, the blunt truth of working in independent comics is that it's, it's very difficult to get people to read your work, particularly it's self-published. But there's strength in numbers. You know, if you want to help get your work out there packaging it with you know a bunch of other cartoonists and working with a bunch of other cartoonists not only helps you to grow but it helps to get your work in front of more eyes you know like if i if i make a comic with my friend juan maybe only five people would read a comic that i make and five people would, would read a comic that he makes but when we put out something together 10 people are reading what i make you know what i mean so it's it's about uh, helping each other and lifting each other up and getting the word out no, yeah, exactly. And it also reminds me, those kind of anthologies reminds me of the kind of collaborative works or anthologies that would come out of Fantagraphics on a regular basis. Uh, sure, and we, we don't, I think we don't we see that much anymore. Loss of, of Mome, oh, which yes. I was drawn in quarterly, right? I think it was such a great publication. And I, I understand that, you know, a publisher is about it's a, like it's a business and if it doesn't make sense to publish mom then they shouldn't publish mom um but you know it's 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 unfortunate that, that we don't have that right now right um, yeah. Now, yeah, Mom was Fantagraphics, but, you know, Drawn in Quarterly, oh, yeah, and you know, I'm like you, I, I mourn the loss of Mom, and we've mentioned this many times on the Comics Alternative, but, you know, Drawn in Quarterly, among others, had Drawn in Quarterly, which was, right, what, a quarterly. Drawn in Quarterly, of course. Yeah. 
Uh, and we don't have that anymore. Again, unfortunate. Yeah, it is. But, you know, it makes sense. Um, I think that really people online have stepped up to try to fill those spaces in a pretty meaningful way. Um, I think that, you know, people, people have really tried to lift other cartoonists up through social media and through sharing their work online. Um, I do think it's unfortunate that, you know, f seemingly for, for anthologies that are published through sites like Kickstarter, et cetera, to succeed, they usually need to have a, a specific theme. And usually those themes are pretty genre driven, which is not, I think is not especially what I'm interested in reading, um, you know, from a selfish perspective. But I think that, you know, if if it doesn't make sense for, for publishers to invest their money in, in these books, we shouldn't ask them to. And we should take that work on ourselves as cartoonists. And I think people have done that pretty admirably, to be frank. Yeah, and that, that's a good point that, you know, online cartoonists have in many ways filled the gaps of um, – what has been lost, I guess, with these kind of smaller anthologies? Now, on the topic of online comics, what are your own thoughts about web comics and working through that medium as opposed to print publication? Is that something that, that you would uh, like to pursue at all right now or not? Oh, sure. Um I mean, I, I, it seems like I'm, I'm bringing this back to like finances pretty frequently, um, which I don't mean to. But, you know, if you're interested in, in making a living as a cartoonist, you have to do work for online. Um, but I, I don't say that with any resistance. I'm happy to do work for the Internet. Um, most of the comics that are available by me online were intended for print. And so I don't love how they look online. And I think it often makes it look like, you know, or one of my anxieties that it is if somebody went to my website and read my comics, they'd be like, well, this looks like ugly when on a printed page, they like don't look ugly, you know, in my opinion, at least. But I, I have moved more since uh, finishing how to survive into specifically producing things for the web and trying to like tackle how things work on the web better. I, I think for me and, and for many cartoonists, there is like a compulsion to just sort of translate the kind of work that we would usually make for print pretty directly into online. Um, but I actually just finished uh, working on a comic a couple of days ago for the nib, um, which is a, a good comics comics website. That is the, my first like solid aggressive attempt at like formatting something specifically for the web. Um, and I, I don't mean that in, in the sort of the way of, you know, like throwing in animated GIFs or, or sound bites or whatever, which are cool. Don't get me wrong. I actually like comics that do that a lot. I appreciate them trying to push those boundaries. But for me, I was more interested in just tr really trying to make something that, that fits on a screen, that makes sense on a screen. Um, and so I'm excited for people to see that, that one coming out. And I'm excited to continue to do that more in the future. I also... Um, uh, irregularly, but hopefully more regularly moving forward, do a, do a series of comics for Vice about some comedians. That's sort of like a more traditional strip, I suppose. When can we expect the nib piece to, to become available? Uh, I believe it's being published on November 18th, so pretty soon. Oh, okay. So <laughs> very soon. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's been in the bag uh, I guess I finished it maybe a week ago, but I think they're holding on to it until the the water settles a little bit from from the election. They're a political comic site primarily, so they're they're working hard on election stuff right now. Oh God, I was wondering if the U.S. presidential elections would come up in this conversation. <laughs> we can breeze on past it if you like. We yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's a depressing to topic. Further. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned – on a much more pleasant note, you mentioned your website. Our listeners, if they want to find out more about your work, they can go to LukeWHealy.com, correct? Yes, that is correct. And there they can learn about uh, some of these titles that we've been discussing, your illustrative work, and you even have a blog. Yeah, I actually just sort of did a little rebuild on my website to make um, the comics there a lot easier to read. So – uh, if people are interested in reading them, I hope that they appreciate that they're, it's not a nightmare to like try and click through a bunch of big paragraphs of text, which is what I used to have. Now, you had mentioned that How to Survive in the North has already been released in the UK overseas and that it's just this week when this episode goes up that U.S. readers will become familiar with and have the opportunity to, to get How to Survive in the North. So um, – 
you're back over in Dublin, right? Which is where yes. you're from. Uh, are you doing anything, maybe not physical travel, but anything for U.S. audiences to help promote the book for No Brow? Um, I am not. Uh, there's nothing currently on the schedule. Um, I, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about the future of the book, um, but I think I can say that um, I will. I will say this. If you are interested in reading this book within the next six months, you should probably go and buy a copy soon. Um, you should probably go to a bookstore and buy a copy because I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be available there until um, there's a, a reprint. Uh, so I'm not going to be over doing anything for it in the United States quite yet because I'll, if by the time I'd be able to get over, um, I'm not sure how available it would be. Okay, that's a little cryptic, but for our listeners, if you want a copy of How to Survive in the North in the United States, <laughs> run out and suffer. get it. It's just like it's <laughs> supplies are, are low, you know, I think. So if you want a copy, you should grab it now before because a, a re it'll be a while before it's reprinted, I think. Okay. Um now you you also mentioned earlier uh, a new project, a long form work that you've started. Is there anything that you can tell us about that? Uh sure, yeah. Um so, uh, it is, <laughs> so the basic sort of like, uh, elevator pitch is that it's a comic that is a relationship memoir, but the two people are me and the United States of America, the country. Um, uh, I've had a pretty, I, from my perspective, at least interesting relationship with the United States, um, over the course of my life, which this summer culminated in, you know, walking over the entire length of the country, um, and so I'm going to do a comic about that. That is partially sort of uh, uh, life history with the United States and partially like a record of this uh, very, very strange trip that I went on. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, just to tease anecdotes, I had like encounters with mountain lions and strange drivers while hitchhiking. And I ended up going to a stranger's wedding and, you know. Lots of lots of fun, good stuff happened. So that's probably a couple of years off, but it, it's coming. <laughs> One of these decades, it'll be at your, uh, at your local bookshop. So those kind of experiences with the United States seem to be all significant and positive. So I'm hoping that what's happened politically in our country recently, you know, doesn't cloud that. I mean, it'll be in there, I'm sure. <laughs> It'll, there'll be flavors of it. Yeah. Well, we don't want to end on a down note. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so again, let me uh, just tell listeners that How to Survive in the North uh, becomes available in the United States this week as you're listening to this. So definitely go to your local bookstore and get a copy. Go to Amazon.com and get a copy. Wherever you can find your comics, get a copy of Luke's new graphic novel. Yeah, some people have been sending me photos, so it should be in some bookstores already. So, you know, I'd appreciate it. Appreciate it. If you'd like to read it, you should read it. Mm. Well, Luke, thank you very much for taking the time and talking with me again for the podcast. This has been a great, uh, long conversation we've had, much more substantial than the one we had at SPX. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I want to thank Luke once again for taking the time and talking with me for the Comics Alternative podcast. His new book, How to Survive in the North, comes out this week from No Brow Press, so make sure you get your copy. And you can find a lot of other great comics like Luke's at the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com, and there you will find a variety of great specials for the month of November. And after you do get your comics there, be sure to get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about my conversation with Luke Healy. If you go to the website comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. 
You can also email the show, we're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media such as Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, you can stream us on Stitcher, you can find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, and on iHeartRadio, and if you're an Android user, via Google Play Music. But you can find every single podcast episode, as well as the various reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. We've got more great interviews lined up in the weeks to come, so be sure to check back for those. Until then, take care.